All right, well, hello everyone, and thank you so much for being here today. We wanna to start by thanking the Department of the Air Force School Liaison Program for making today's webinar on helping military connected teens develop independency skills possible. Thank you for those that took our poll. We often have professional join us, join, join us for our webinars and we welcome all professionals. We really think that you'll find a lot of the information and tips that we present today useful, but we do wanna note that our MSEC parent support webinars have been designed with parents as our target audience. Before we introduce ourselves, we just wanna take a moment to tell you a little bit more about the Military Child Education Coalition and its mission. Military Child Education Coalition, or MSEC, is a nonprofit organization that was established over 24 years ago. We'll be celebrating our 25th anniversary here coming up next year with the mission of supporting all military connected children by educating, advocating, and collaborating to resolve those education challenges associated with our unique military lifestyle. In 2005, MSEC formalized support and programming for military connected parents so that they may be empowered, informed, and proactive in supporting their children's educational journey. We strive to deliver informative and interactive webinars that address academic, social, and emotional issues associated with the military family lifestyle. Our vision at MSEC is for every military connected child to be college, work, and life ready. My name is Katherine Katowski. I have been married to an active duty soldier for the past 15 years, and we have three military connected kids in eighth grade, sixth grade, and fourth grade. So we are just now embarking on that adventure of having teenagers in our home. We just PCS from Washington State to the National Capital Region, and I have been a parent educator with MSEC since early 2021. And I am joined today by Mich with Michelle Bashir, who will introduce herself. Thank you. Uh, my name is Michelle Bashir, and I'm joining you today from beautiful Madison, Alabama, which is a little suburb outside of Huntsville, Alabama, the Rocket City. Um, I grew up and lived near Hershey, Pennsylvania my entire life until I married a second lieutenant just a week out of college way back in 1988, a long time ago. And we had 30 year, exciting years of active duty Army service and ra have raised two incredible military connected children. So we're very proud of them. And we are now enjoying the stability that my husband retirement has allowed. And we haven't moved since 2013. So nine, over nine years now. It's very exciting for me. And I've been working with MSEC in support of our military families as a parent educator since 2017. So now that you know, let me give you a little quick administrative announcement. Uh, at the end of the webinar, we would encourage you and like you to uh, take our survey about today's presentation. We really would appreciate if you took the two to three minutes it will require to give us your feedback. This is a key method that we use to let our funders know what we're doing and um, let us know if we need to tweak things so we can continue offering you, um, our military connected parents, the best training opportunities that we can. Uh, you will see a chat box on your screen, kind of looks like a little cartoon bubble if you haven't already found that to open. And you can ask questions there and make comments during our webinar, and we encourage you to do that. So please use that feature during Zoom. You should see a PDF file in the chat box, um, 2022 resource. Uh, this contains the resources and information relating to today's webinar. But please know if you are joining us by your phone, you won't be able to download that resource. So you can private message us and we will send with your email, we will send that out to you later today. This webinar is being recorded. I know that you can always view the recording later if you want to review this material. Maybe you want to share it with others, or perhaps you'll have some technical issues and you just want to make sure you've gotten it all. So at this time, Catherine and I will turn our webcams off so that you can focus on the presentation. And we'll start. So by the end of this workshop, we would like their parents and caregivers that are watching this to be able to identify some of the main changes that occur during this adolescent time. Recognize the importance of independency during the teenage years. Understand the role that the parent or the parent or caregiver role during this independent gaining process and discuss 
uh, and develop strategies that parents can use to help their teens acquire these independency skills. So some of the main changes, adolescence is a transitional phase of growth and development between childhood and adulthood. And these teenage years can be sometimes overwhelming time for both teens right, and their parents or families. So it's not uncommon for parents or guardians to feel at a loss at times for just how to handle their teenagers during this transitional period of development. Our children go through so many changes during this adolescence. Um, defined by the ages of 10 through 19 by the World Health Organization. So some of the changes include they gain 50% of their adult body weight during that time. They experience a tremendous amount of internal and external body changes. They become capable of reproducing, right? And all the changes that go along with that. They start assuming adult responsibilities, such as maybe finding a job, working on those romantic relationships and learning how to be just a good friend. Their brain transforms enormously. It continues to develop all the way through adolescence, although it doesn't fully mature into an adult brain until the mid twenties. And that's important for us to remember. So during adolescence, the brain is highly flexible, which means that teenagers are constantly taking in new information and forming those ideas, opinions, and connections. This is important. The decision-making centers don't develop until late, fully develop until late in adolescence. So it's important to note this as many parents may need to offer more guidance in decision-making during that time. For example, learning not to make those important decisions while those emotions are high. Like it's a good lesson for adults as well. And much of the passion, sensitivity, and enthusiasm for new experiences are related to that brain's emotional center's rapid development during this time. So we have a question for you. Have you found yourself thinking, why is my child being so sensitive or so emotional? And if you know how to use those little hand raising features that are in your Zoom, go ahead and use them if you think, yep, there we go often wonder about that. So in the following video, Dr. Anisha Abraham will answer our questions about maybe why our teens have those heightened emotions. And if it's a little quiet, well, you may have to turn up your volume a little bit. Teen brain development is a fascinating part of the development during adolescence. And I think it's important for parents to know that the brain is a work in progress during the teen years. And in fact, the brain is not fully developed until about 25 years of age. Um, certainly, young people also may have a heightened kind of emotional response to things that are happening during the adolescence. One of the things that we know, an important concept, is that the limbic system, which has to do with pleasure and reward, is a little bit stronger during the teen years than something else called the prefrontal cortex, which has to do with logic and rational thought and self-awareness. And that partly is the reason why teenagers may experience things in a heightened way, because the limbic system, which has to do with emotions and pleasure and reward, is much stronger. And I think parents probably still remember the music they listened to when they were a teenager, and maybe remember their first crushes or attractions, because all of those experiences and feelings are much stronger during the teen years. Um, the other thing that we know is that the frontal lobe is very much developed during the adolescence period, and connections are being fully made to the brain during that time. And we know that that area is very much part of executive functioning and decision making. And it isn't until later that in adolescence that all of these connections are fully made. So for all of these reasons, we know that teen brain development is really important in terms of emotional decision making in adolescence. And that certainly protecting the teen brain and getting young people to sleep well, to eat well, to not use alcohol and drugs, which all affect the teen brain is a very important part of what we can do as parents to guide them. So, wow, interesting. So the awareness of our teens' physical and emotional changes and all this information that we just got from that little video can help us as parents and caregivers set those realistic expectations of our children's behaviors and our re and reactions when trying to help them become more independent. So we need to be there to guide them, um, to guide them through these adolescent years. So I'm going to send it back to Catherine to talk about how parental roles change during these years. Thanks, Michelle. 
So one of a parent's goals is to raise young people to become thriving adults. And your role as the parent of a teen is not going to be quite the same as it was for when our children were younger. When kids are young, parents, we manage pretty much every aspect of their lives, right? From what time they go to bed to when and what they eat, what activities they do. And we make most of their decisions for them. But with our teens, that level of involvement is going to start to change. So here are some things that parents should consider when parenting their teenagers. First, parents must help their teenagers reach that milestone of independence. As we're riding that independence roller coaster, we just need to know that our job is to show a lot of love and support. Also, it's good to keep in mind that teenagers don't think like little kids anymore, but they don't think like adults yet either. They feel like teenagers. And because of that, our parenting strategies kind of have to evolve too and develop according to our child's stage. Also, just remember that the parent role may change, but its importance to our kids absolutely does not change. We are still a critical part of their lives. So as parents, we have to try to empathize with our teenagers and try to understand how our adolescents are seeing the world and how they're seeing their own independence. So let's talk about how independence looks to our teenagers. Independence for a teen means establishing their identity and becoming in many ways a separate individual. So what does that look like practically? So first, teens wanna be involved in the decision-making particularly in those areas that are related to themselves. For example, they want to be part of deciding what they're wearing every day and when or if they get a haircut or visit a hairstylist. They are going to want an input on when they do their homework and also how they arrange their room may be something they want a say in. This is especially true for our military connected kids when we move and they are redesigning their rooms in a new space. And we strongly encourage you to give them that control. Let them decide what their room looks like. They also are going to want to have a say in how they spend their allowance or their income or their money if they have any. Teens are also going to start wanting to have an input on their role as a member of your family. They may want more say about family matters. For example, our military connected teens may want to share their opinion regarding the next duty station. The next time you're looking at a list, they may have thoughts too. They also may want a voice in what they're eating, where everyone is going on family days out or vacations. And it's not to say they're the last word, they just want to have their opinion heard as well. They may also have an opinion about what movies they wanna watch as a family. And teens may also wanna provide input when creating rules and setting boundaries, particularly the ones that apply to them. So we have another question and we'd love your input. Um, it, uh, in that chat box, can you think of any family rules that your teen would like to change in your house? And please, we'd love to see those in the chat box. I know in my house, my teen and also my tween would really love it if they could change the rule that requires them to check in with me before they watch a new show for the first time or watch a new movie. And they would definitely love to change that feature where I have to approve any apps that they purchase or put on their electronic devices. They would like a lot more autonomy over what they are getting to watch without my input. So if you have any other family rules that you think your teens would love to change, we'd still love you to put those in your chat box. So as our teens are getting older, they are also developing their own independent opinions and values. You may notice teens becoming more argumentative as they're striving to assert their own views and their own beliefs. And this is a part of life where we may see that they switch from conforming to their parents' opinions to following their friends' opinions. Teens also start becoming independent partially because we, their parents, are starting to spend less actual time with them. Um, 
some parents are, as their teens are getting older, may know less about their teens' activities or the names of, and parents of all their friends or their preferences or some of their experiences. Teens are taking on new responsibilities as, you know, maybe some of them are starting to drive. Some of them are getting, when they're starting to work or participating more activities outside your home. And some teens are going to start pushing boundaries. They're going to argue for the sake of arguing or compete with parents for that battle for power. And we should be mindful that especially our military teens with, you know, that have possibly experienced several family separations, whether it was due to deployment or TDY, temporary duty somewhere else, or geo-batching where the service member lives somewhere else at a duty station than the family. In a lot of cases, this can cause, give our our military connected teens more opportunities to have those separations and actually become independent faster than some of their civilian peers. And I see in the chat box um, that my teen would love to grab fast food anytime he wishes rather than eating with the family, 100%. They would, I think I know my teens also would love it if they got to make all of the food decisions in our house. Thank you for putting that in there in the chat box. It's very challenging to find that balance between giving our teens too much freedom and being overprotective. This is one of our biggest obstacles as parents of teens. However, just know that it's healthy and totally natural and part of how our teen grows into being an independent adult to get some of that pushback. Independence is actually a learned skill. Though some teens are going to develop it quicker than others, no one just naturally is born knowing how to be independent and take care of themselves. Just like learning to walk or drive a car, we need to teach our teens the steps to becoming confident, capable adults. So what happens when parents foster independency skills in their teens? Teens will start depending less on their parents and their caregivers. They will start taking on more responsibility in their own lives. They'll be able to make thoughtful decisions and solve problems. They will be able to work out their own life values and they will start forming their own identity. This is all a part of becoming an adult. Now know, of course, that in that process, there are gonna be some challenges. Parents and teenagers are probably going to disagree on how long that process should take to achieve those objectives. And most teens are going to see themselves more ready or ready sooner than their parents think they are to take on a lot of that responsibility. So with that, I want us to think about how do parents begin to foster independence in their teenagers? And I'm going to pass it back to Michelle. Thank you, Catherine. So to begin fostering independence in teens, we're going to look at three main strategies. We're going to look at setting rules, those boundaries, those guides right, for conduct, uh, responsibilities, and how to give teens adequate responsibilities, framing those responsibilities as opportunities to grow while we teach life, social, and emotional skills, such as time management and organization, money make, managing, um, those social and emotional skills and decision making. And then we'll look at balanced parenting. You probably heard about of helicopter parenting, you know, hovering over their children all the time, or maybe those lawnmower parents, right? Mowing down a path, removing all the obstacles for their children. Well, we're going to look at balanced parenting. That What does that look like in a parent-teen relationship and using failure as a learning tool? So research has shown that children thrive from routine and stability. The creation of these boundaries and the comfort that youth find in them does not change when children become teenagers, especially our military-connected teens that deal with so much change in their lives. So setting up these age-appropriate rules is crucial. So some things to consider when setting up these rules. We understand that conflict can occur when teens feel that the rules are just a way of controlling them and interfering with that their independence. And we have to remember that every child is different. Therefore, rules and expectations should reflect their maturity 
level and not necessarily their age. Could be different with different children in the house, which that can be a difficult thing to get around. Um, establishing collaboration with the, the teen when looking at those family values, creating buy-in. So when teenagers have input on those expectations and the consequences, they're much more likely to support them. So sit down with them and, and create these rules together. Give teens a chance to be heard. You know, maybe there's a reason they think that rule is a little bit too, you know, stringent, but try to do your best, respect and validate their feelings. Boundaries and rules can be flexible. So as limits can be different for different children, they can also be different in each situation. So they should evolve as your teen grows older and they mature. If parents or limits are too strict, the child really truly may not have enough time, enough room, excuse me, to grow and to try those new experiences. This is a, a learning curve for both parent and child. So parents must be prepared for some trial and error on both parts. Mistakes will be made. Parents' forgiveness should be modeled by, by you, right? Parent, and parents should also not overreact when a child makes a mistake. Best to learn from that and just move on. So let's look at the rule categories. Dr. Smitana, a professor of psychology whose research examines adolescent parent relationships, research suggests that when establishing boundaries, consider having rules fall into the following categories. Safety. So let's look at safety when I have a question for you. Uh, what do you think will be your teen's first reaction if you just move to a new duty station and you say the following, I don't want you to go with your friends alone. So if anybody has an input, I know I've been there. Um, I imagine Catherine has been there. Um, you know, they want to go out with their friends and their new friends and, and go to do something with them or go to their house. And, you know, you as a parent aren't too excited about that. I know that my kids have had that many times. Um, it's difficult, it's a difficult balance, not wanting to maybe scare them, but yet keeping them safe. And I know I've explained that, you know, sometimes we just move to a new place and we don't know the family. So it's better that we get together in groups or as a family. Yeah, maybe a little over being overprotective, but we don't know that. And that's how they feel, right? We're overprotective until maybe we get to know that family better. And that's kind of how I've framed it around the whole safety part. And teams are definitely more likely to accept a rule if they understand it is to keep them safe. As an adult, you know, we understand that it may not be safe to go to places that you're not familiar with, um, but we may think it's obvious to teens, but without an explanation about the whole safety element, sometimes teens may think it's a personal attack on them, like we don't trust them, you're being overprotective, right, or, or their friends, you know, you don't trust my friends, well, I don't know your friends yet, or their families. So values. Children need a fundamental sense of right and wrong to make sure that they're prepared to make those wide choice, wise choices, right? Make those contribution to the world and become stable adults. So some of the considerations for parents and teaching those values is teens really do see parents as, as the source of their values, at least initially, right? They're watching you their whole life. So consider framing or establishing rules around your family values. Say we value family time. So one of our rules is no electronic devices during dinner. That's our time together. We have to remember that every family's beliefs will be different, but maybe another good thing to point out when asked, well, why can't they go along with their new friend? They're allowed, you know, they have other people they're allowed to go. So these types of rules will definitely help your teen develop the virtues that you value in your home. And then how to act in society. So parents are children's first teachers, right? Especially regarding social situations. Parents teach them how to behave in public and interact appropriately with their peers, mostly through modeling, right? So things that parents must consider when establishing these type of rules. Take the time to explain why the rule is in place. For instance, uh, you need to be home by 10 o'clock 
uh, in the evening on a school day. That allows everyone in the house to get to their sleep that's required uh, for school or for work, you know, for the parents. Uh, make it clear that these rules are in place to prepare them to be successful in their future. These type of rules give teens ownership of their personal territory. So as Catherine explained, they can, their clothing, their hair, their, um, their music, all kind of their own territory when setting those rules. When parents and teens disagree on specific rules, that open communication will be needed. And when setting rules, again, we wanna make sure that they're established based on caring, right? We want the best for them, not simply controlling them. So I have another question for you, one other engagement question. Looking at those three categories, safety, values, and how to act in society, share an example of a rule that could fall under one of those categories in the chat box. So um, let's see, I think values, uh, you know, our family, as I'm sure many just teach the golden rule, right? Treat others as you want them to treat, they want them to treat you. So that's, that's an easy one, but that's, um, let's see. Yeah, I think maybe being on time is important, um, taking, respecting other people's time. So I'm going to transfer it back to Catherine to talk more about responsibilities. Thanks, Michelle. All right, trivia time. I'm going to read a quote. And if you know which movie that quote point came from, you put it in the chat box, please. And I will go ahead and give you a hint. It's a superhero movie. And that quote is, with great power comes great responsibility. So if you know what movie that came from, go ahead and put that in the chat box. I don't see any answers. We'll come back to that. So teenage years are when our children start gaining the privileges that come with responsibility. Some parents are sometimes not sure if their teens are ready for more responsibility and more privileges. And some parents are afraid of giving their teens too much freedom. Oh, I see one. Yes, and Michelle got it right. The movie is Spider-Man. That was some wisdom that Uncle Ben gave to Peter Parker. So some parents hold on, or some parents are kind of afraid of giving their teens too much freedom before they're ready. And some parents want to hold on denying teens the responsibilities they require to develop that maturity and the opportunities that they need to make choices and accept their consequences. So it's a, it's a hard decision to make, it's hard to know. So here are some things to consider when trying to decide if your teens can move towards more responsibility. First, how often does your teen think about future consequences of decisions or their behaviors? Next, can your teen identify the pros and cons of different options? Also, how impulsive is your child? Can they think before they act? That is, do they have reasonable impulse control? Learning to be responsible and having freedom is all a part of becoming a capable adult. And it's important for us as parents to provide opportunities for our teens to show us that they can be responsible. And these opportunities can happen anywhere. You can find them at school, letting them manage their own homework. You can let them at work by letting them get a job, an age appropriate job at home with home responsibilities and even with their friends. Age appropriate responsibilities should also be a way to earn more privileges and to develop those life skills to become confident, independent adults. So we have another video for you. You might need to turn your volume up for this one. It might be a little quiet. It's about helping teens achieve their potential. Well, I think that parents can help teens live up to their potential by um, setting high expectations is one. So oftentimes I think we tend to underestimate adolescence. Um, it is a time when they're undergoing a lot of wonderful change um, and they're really attuned to kind of social relationships and social information. Um, but we need to understand that they are sort of particularly you know, wired for that kind of change so that they're really sort of set up 
um, to meet the needs of adolescents. Adolescence is a time when young people need opportunities to practice the adult roles that they're preparing for, um, to gain experience in social relationships, um, to engage in kind of complex decision making that may have important implications for their future. So supporting opportunities um, for those kinds of skill, skills to develop in teens is something that parents really need to encourage. It's also important that parents understand that adolescents are likely to make mistakes. The ways in which they make decisions during adolescence when oftentimes social, you know, the immediate social context may um, be more important or more salient than, you know, sort of the long distant future can make it look like they're not making the kinds of decisions that adults might agree with. Um, but I think it's important to understand that adolescents may make decisions um, that are not ideal um, and that they'll have an opportunity to learn from them. So opportunities to make mistakes and seeing those mistakes as learning opportunities, I think, is really critical. So that one mistake doesn't necessarily mean that an adolescent faces lifelong penalties. And mistakes, again, are really opportunities for growth. So because it's a period of tremendous growth, then um, having a chance to make mistakes um, is important and having an opportunity to practice some of the kinds of skills that adolescents will need in adulthood um, is really important. I love in that video how she refers to it as practicing being an adult, because that's really what it is, giving our kids these opportunities to actually have some responsibility and let it play out especially knowing that they're going to make some mistakes. So let's talk about some of those life skills that we can help our teens develop so they can have that responsibility and build that independence. Life, social, and emotional skills, they're all opportunities for our teens to start learning responsibilities. And depending on your family's individual circumstances, it's entirely possible that your military-connected teen may have already had to take on some additional responsibilities that maybe their civilian peers didn't. So such as when a, you know, the service member in your house was gone, or we have a special subset of military-connected youth who have had to take on new and additional caregiving responsibilities when they have a service member who is wounded, ill, or injured. Regardless of your circumstances, here are some practical ideas of life lessons that parents can provide to their kids. First, at home, teach kids to cook. Knowing how to just prepare food or cook food, it's one of the primary life skills that teenagers can learn. Doesn't have to be complicated. You can totally start with the basics and let them build based on their interests. But don't be afraid of letting them start preparing their own food, especially initially under your guidance and supervision. Consider teaching them some of those basic food skills so they can live independently after leaving home. Not only does that include the cooking, but think about things like appropriately storing food, what to refrigerate and what not to refrigerate, and how long between cooking it can they still eat it, um, and looking at expiration dates, all skills that they need when they go out on their own. Even consider having them plan meals, and for those that can drive, buying the groceries for you and, and finding out what it means to shop for a family. Also, teach them how to use and maintain kitchen appliances, like the coffee maker and the dishwasher, how to load it properly. I know that's a big one in my house, not just loading it, but loading it correctly. And how to use the oven. If when they're little, we keep them away from the oven, but once they're big and tall enough to reach everything, it's time for them to learn how. And this may sound really obvious, but sometimes teens only know how to use the microwave and they may not know how to properly clean items to make sure that they're clean and safe and sanitary. So we have another question for you in the chat box. We'd love to know what life skills have you taught your teen in the kitchen already? I know for me, I needed a little push with this. I didn't realize that my kids were old enough to start learning how to do some of these things in the kitchen. So at the suggestion of a friend, I actually taught my daughter how to fry an egg on the stovetop and eventually how to boil pasta, basically how to make her own macaroni and cheese, and was shocked at how capable she was. I just hadn't given her a chance to do it. Um, Michelle says, in the summer, each kid had a night to make dinner. Awesome. Then they had to create a shopping list and cook it on their night. That is fantastic. That is wonderful adult life practice. Thank you for sharing that. 
Also, again, how to clean the pan the right way. Certain pans go into the dishwasher and certain pans and knives don't. And so these are skills that we can teach them while they're still in our homes. Also, in, in that same idea of, of cleaning things, we should include our teens in basic maintenance of the house. We should teach them how to vacuum, how to dust, how to clean the house, how to know when to clean the house. We should also make sure, this is an example that comes up a lot with kids when they head out on their own, is make sure we teach them how to wash clothes, whether they're doing it by hand or using a wash machine, and how to deal with simple stains. Which ones are we rinsing out with hot water and which ones are we rinsing out with cold water and when to use the stain stick and which kind of soaps to, and detergents to use. Um, make sure they know how to read and understand fabric labels. So the nice sweaters don't end up in the dryer if they're not supposed to. All skills that kids can learn while they're still in our homes. We should also think about teaching them to do simple repairs around the house. Things like changing the air filter in your HVAC system or checking the batteries in the smoke detectors and changing them out. If you have to bring in a professional for repairs in your home, walk your team through the process of how to hire someone for that kind of job, how to look for them, how to even maybe have your team help you do the research online to find the right kind of professional to, to do the job. And for military families that move frequently, if you're living in military housing, teach your teen how to call maintenance and how to supervise repairs. I, I think a lot of adults even, but especially our teens, don't have many opportunities to make phone calls, actual voice phone calls, because we do so much online. So maybe it's a good time to have your team watch you make a phone call and maybe even practice making a phone call themselves. Emily says her daughter needed to learn what needs to be dry clean. Yes. And what could be washed in the washing machine. That is an absolutely critical life skill for maintaining our nice clothes. So that is a great skill. Thank you for, for sharing that. So another really important life skill that we need to start developing in our teens are time management and organization. Lack of organization is one factor that's gonna lead to poor time management in a lot of cases. And sometimes military connected teens, they're having to move to different schools, you know, sometimes over the summer, but sometimes even in the middle of the year. And I think we all know that that can be really stressful. If they have those good time management and organization skills under their belt, that can really help them during these times of transition if they do need to catch up with their new school. So we have another question. How often have you heard your teenager complain about not having enough time to do everything they need to do? Anybody else besides me hearing how they're, I just had a conversation with my daughter today about her being concerned she didn't have enough time to do all the things. So please pop that in the chat box. We love to hear, <laughs> Michelle says frequently, yes, <laughs> frequently. They don't, our teens are complaining that they don't have enough time to do all the things. So what do we do? How do we help them with time management and organization short of telling them exactly what to do all the time? Instead, we need to help our teens identify important and urgent tasks and how to prioritize. That's a skill that has to be practiced. Also then teach our adolescents to organize their time using a simple timetable or a planner. A lot of schools will give kids planners for free that they can use to manage their homework. Talk to your kids about maximizing those planners, using all the tabs and all the spaces. And then let them create their own schedule. Remember what Michelle said before about kids being able to contribute to the boundaries or the things that are involved in their lives and their decision making, let them contribute to creating their own schedule. And then let them decide when they need to get up in the morning and how much time they need for chores and other activities. This may involve you helping them do a little backwards planning. You know, this is what time they need to be outside in the bus. And if they want to do homework and shower and fix their hair or makeup or whatever, how much time do they need to get up in order to have enough time to do all those things they want to do. And also, as always, 
we can help them by modeling good time management behavior. Let them see your planner or your calendar and let them see how you manage time and pick priorities. We actually have, MSEC has webinars dedicated to time management and organization. And Michelle is going to put a link in your chat box to, uh, to access a lot of those webinars. So another absolutely critical life skill is managing money. Financial discipline is a critical skill that kids need to learn while they're in their teens. Teens should know when and how to spend and to save and understand basic financial concepts if they're going to become self-sufficient adults. So we have a poll for you, another poll question. We would love to know which, if any, of the, these financial accounts your children currently have. Checking accounts, savings accounts, debit cards, credit cards, investments, maybe all of the above, maybe none of the above, or something else. And if there's an other, we would love to hear for you to contribute that, share that in the chat box. I see in all of the above, awesome. In savings accounts, let's see, I know we've got a couple of responses. We've got savings accounts, all of the above. That's really, really great to hear. So things that parents and caregivers can do to help teens learn money management. First, teach them how to make a budget and then help them create their own budget. Again, getting their own input on how they're spending any money or resources they may have. Budgeting skills help our teenagers learn the value of money, learn them, teaches them how to practice conscious spending and also future planning. Also, especially our older teens, show them how to open a bank account and how to responsibly use an ATM and a debit card or a credit card and the critical differences between a debit card or a credit card. Also, teach them how to, or teaching them how to not get into debt using a credit card and teaching them how credit works. This is crucial. It's important that we explain to them how quickly a person can get sucked into that whirlpool of debt if they're not careful. So all of these are great life skills that we can teach our kids while they're still in our own homes. And with that, I'm going to pass it to Michelle, who's going to talk about social and emotional skills. Okay, thanks, Catherine. So our teens need certain abilities, these social and emotional abilities to achieve their fullest potential at work, school, and in their private life. These social and emotional abilities can help them recognize and manage their emotions, help them cope with obstacles and their life's challenges, and enhance communication skills, and including interpersonal feelings like empathy. So all these skills can be learned, but teens need a chance to practice them under the guidance of experienced adults. So what are some of the ways? Listening, hearing what people say, is a valuable communication skill that significantly impacts the quality of our relationship with others. Parents and caregivers can teach their teens how to active listening, a skill that allows us to hear not only the words people are saying, but also the emotions that they're reflecting, maybe through their nonverbal behavior. Teach them to rephrase what the other person is saying. Um, so I think I heard you say, you know, that you are listening and you just want to understand. Help them understand that many times they'll listen to, they'll hear different points of view and they may disagree with them and that is okay. Learning how to properly deal with those different points of view is also learned. So parents, once again, we are models for our children and how we deal with others' different viewpoints. So speaking about that nonverbal communication, it is one of the most critical aspects of dealing with people. The ability to understand and display proper nonverbal signs during communication or any other interaction between people. It gives everyone those cues and information about the true message that's being communicated. So some of the ways that teens can practice their own nonverbal communication skills is work on establishing that eye contact. That can be really hard for some of our more shy kids, right? We want to make sure we're facing people when we are speaking to them. Smile, you know, have a positive outlook, sitting up straight and concentrating on the tone of their voice, like saying nice to meet you loud and clear while looking into that person's eyes versus 
you know, it's nice to meet you, said quietly while maybe looking down the ground. Same words, totally different communication. Military families move frequently, as we know, so we can show maybe even practicing with our teen on how to introduce themselves to new people. So a little role playing can take some the time, some of the nerves away uh, out of that next meeting with maybe a new friend, uh, a teacher, a coach, or maybe a potential employer. So if you aren't already aware, um, MSEC has a wonderful student-led organization that welcomes incoming students to their schools and helps departing students prepare for their next school. These are the student-to-student -student programs. MSEC teaches student-to-student -student members who greet new incoming students a strategy to help provide that framework to interact with new people called FORT, F-O-R-T, which is an acronym for friends and family. Do you have any siblings? How many, you know, where, where are you from? Other places you've lived and traveled. So what do you like about living here? Where did you go on vacation? Uh, recreation are, what do you like to do for fun? What sports or clubs are you interested in? And the last T transition, hmm, what do I need to know about our new school, our town? These conversation starters, this strategy enables our children to ask easy, non-invasive questions or share information about themselves so others can learn about them and they can learn about others. Assertiveness. Practicing assertiveness and self-advocacy are critical skills. Assure teens that it's okay to claim their rights, ask, and initiate and express their opinions and feelings. Stress that it's okay to say no to others in a respectful way. Uh, to practice these skills, you can consider having your teen do some of the following. Give an honest compliment to someone. Learn maybe two new things about someone in their class. This is especially helpful after moving to that new school, right? Joining a new club or an activity. Share with a friend what's been on your mind lately. Like, oh, I'm so excited about the upcoming football game. Call and schedule a doctor's appointment. And I, I will tell you, this is one thing that my son, he had a test scheduled in college his freshman year, the same day as a dental appointment, which was obviously made like six months before, right? And he was so afraid they were going to be mad at him when he called the dental office, he kept putting it off. So I, you know, having to explain to him that, no, they appreciate that you let them know in advance and reschedule. Um, or, you know, talk to a teacher or a coach if there's something that was misunderstood and needed clarified. Yeah, prescriptions, that's a really big one too. That's, that's a very important one. Emotional awareness. Self-awareness is the ability to understand our own inner processes and relate adequately with others. So emotional awareness in this context is the ability to recognize our feelings and the foundation of emotional intelligence. Parents and caregivers can help their teenagers to, you know, recognize and understand their feelings and how to handle them. Recognize that these feelings um, that you have, others have. So have that feeling of empathy. That, you know, for others. Establish and value relationships. So during adolescent relationships become a huge part of a child's life. Helping them develop those healthy and valuable relationships can have a huge impact on their development. So it can help your teen by um, having them develop those relationships and value all people, like their friends, their teachers, the principal, the janitor, the lunch lady, so everybody that, you know, they have contact with. Maintain those healthy family relationships, you know, at home. And res again, respect people and their points of view, which may not always be the same as theirs. Teaching your child skills and manners that would display, they would display in a social setting is also essential for them to have a good social life. So the character of an individual can show in the way they behave. So consider maybe learning etiquette, how to be a good host or a good guest. Probably at this point, they'd be more of a guest, right? Choosing the right kind of clothes for the specific occasion. Um, and 
tell your teen that, you know, what their clothes say about them, what their hair says about them, uh, says a shows a level of respect that they'll get in certain situations, such as an interview, what you can wear, you know, to the movies is not what you would wear on an interview. So one great, great way to show teens these skills is doing something that most teens love to do, watch a movie or a television show or, you know, streaming something. So watch it together. Consider stopping the show or actually maybe wait till the show is over and discuss, ask your team what they were thinking. How were the characters behaving and hey, what would they do in that situation? There are opportunities to do this in almost everything we watch from news, um, sitcoms, you know, and movies. And then learning about moral behavior, um, honesty, character. Teens have to learn to accept that they have make, are going to make mistakes and then take responsibility for their actions. Parents, we can help them to um, help them apologize and not feel embarrassed about it. Understanding that, of course, mistakes happen and we as parents shouldn't overreact. Ask for help when needed. Uh, sure, we want them to be self-reliant. We're teaching them independence, but there are times when we all need help, even as adults. And again, embrace failure as it is just a part of learning. And then decision making. Teens make potentially life altering decisions every day. Unfortunately, most teens have never been taught how to make decisions. So teens who are given both limits and freedom to make their own decisions tend to be self driven and self disciplined. According to neuropsychologist William Stixwood, and teen coach Ned Johnson, authors of The Self-Driven Child, parents should hand the decision reins over to their children. And we'll discuss decision-making in detail in up some upcoming slides. The parent role changes when teens hit those years. And while teens are trying to figure out their identity and how to be autonomous, parents are trying to figure out what's their role. So professor of pediatrics at Children's Hospital in Philadelphia and a longtime member of M6 Science Advisory Board, Ken Ginsberg recommends that balanced parenting we were talking about um, base, it's based on um, showing high amounts of love and warmth while still having those rules and monitoring them. Research shows that balanced parents, parenting kids are more likely to follow the rules. Those parent-child relationships are stronger. Children have fewer mental health problems, such as depression or anxiety. They have better outcomes in school. They're less likely to be bullied or to be the bully. They're less likely to use drugs. They delay that first sexual encounter. And when they do, they are more likely to use protection. Children are less likely to be in car accidents and more likely to use their seatbelt. I mean, these, there's so many positive benefits. And um, Catherine has put a link in the chat box to a video about balanced parenting, a short video from Ken that we encourage you to check out uh, when you have a moment. And then also the um, there is a webinar based on balanced parenting and that webinar link is in the chat box. The balanced parenting style helps us strengthen that parent team relationship. So they're, are they're making those life altering decisions every day. So we need to help them learn how to make the right decisions. I know a lot of times when our kids were in school and they would go out for the night, I'd say, make good decisions. <laughs> that would be the last thing that they would hear from me rather than I, and, and I love you. Um, but things parents can do is involve those teens again in that decision-making process. Um, give, give teens a say regarding maybe which clubs or sports to sign up for when they arrive at that new duty station. Maybe they want to change. Maybe they've done something for a long time. Have that open listening. Listen openly to what they have to say and not be Think critically about each choice, what will work, what's problematic about each decision. Teach by example. Um, and then help kids to be accountable. They might not always make the right decision, but they need to be accountable for their choices. And I'm going to turn it over to Catherine and talk about that more decision making. Thanks, Michelle. So we are going to talk about the five-step decision-making model. 
Um, this is just a practical decision-making model from Very Well Family that parents can then use to teach teens how to make healthy decisions. So first, you're going to start by providing guidance. Now remember, we're guiding, but we don't want to overdo it. And we also want to provide input when necessary and also let our teens experience some of those natural consequences. But even when they are experiencing those natural consequences, make sure that we're there for them when they fail, because it is going to happen and it's okay. And it's a natural part of the learning process. Also, we also want to help them identify the problem. Help your teen spell out a problem and then teach them to size the problem the right way. Is this something that we need to panic about or is this not a huge deal that we can relax and deal with calmly? Also, brainstorm options with your teen and encourage them to identify all the different options. Challenge them to actually identify as many choices as possible. Even the things that they think might not work, just go ahead and put it out there and put it on the list of possible options. Then you want to review the pros and cons. Encourage your teen to write down that list of pros and cons for each of the options that they came up with. And then ask them to identify which options appear to be best based on their pro-con list. Then talk to them about how emotions can play a significant role in these decisions. You know, for example, fear may be preventing them from doing something. And then finally, create a plan. Identify the next steps and examine whether your child's choice was effective and that can help them make better decisions in the future. So we want this to kind of become just part of like a natural reaction to when they're trying to make decisions. So let's talk about learning from failure because we've mentioned it a bunch of times today. Part of moving into adulthood is taking healthy risks. And when parents create safe boundaries like the ones that we've talked about, Parents are either are creating an environment that allow teenagers to test themselves. And when our teens fail, which is they will sometimes, they need to be able to process that mistake and then recover from it and continue. So Dr. Ginsburg, who Michelle mentioned, has seven helpful tips for helping your adolescent learn from their mistakes. Number one, stay calm. Parents need to stay calm. If we can't maintain our sense of control, the teens are going to sense it and they're going to take in their parents' feelings, all those big feelings. Also, wait until your teen has calmed down. Teens are going to have a hard time absorbing what's being taught if they are in panic mode. And for young people to gain those protective insights, they need to have the capacity to take it in, to be thoughtful. And uh, pretty much nobody can be thoughtful or reflective when they are in that panic spiral. Also, try not to lecture. Lectures typically are going to backfire, I think, as many of us have probably already experienced. Teens are not necessarily going to understand or even hear those lectures, especially if the teen is already upset. Our goal is for kids to come to their own conclusions and find their own solutions. This is enabling them to have those life experience to add to their growing tool belt of decision-making smarts. Also, we want to avoid using guilt. It really feels... it. Chances are they already feel bad about what they've done. Instead, talk to them about concerns and then brainstorm some potentially better ways to handle their situations. Another phrase to avoid is, I told you so. Just don't say it. It doesn't work. It's ineffective. And it just makes you sound smug, which discourages our teens from asking for help the next time they make a mistake. Instead, let them know that making mistakes is totally human to reinforce your role as their sounding board. And on that note, it is really important to listen. You don't have to fix all their problems. You just need to let them know that you trust them and their ability to work through a problem and then let them try to solve issues themselves and come to their own solutions while using you as their sounding board while they talk it out. Also, and probably most importantly, give unconditional love. Let your children know you love them even, maybe even especially when they make mistakes. Remind them that there's always a chance for forgiveness, there's always a chance to try again, but maybe with a different approach the next time. 
Unconditional love does not mean unconditional acceptance of their behaviors or choices. You don't have to accept behaviors that compromise safety or family values, but you should always accept your child. So a few final thoughts as we wrap up our training today. We just want to highlight that the teenage years are a real small window of opportunity for children to slowly practice how to become adults. Fostering a safe environment to do this is the parent's responsibility. Provide opportunities for your teenagers to practice those life skills and to show you they can do it. They can be responsible. And remember to enjoy this journey as best you can with your child and to strengthen your relationships during these teen years. Thank you so much for being with us. I'm now going to pass it to Michelle, who's going to share some really great MSEC resources. Thank you. So this is where we give you the opportunity and invite you to take our survey for today's webinar. You can do this by clicking on the link that will be shortly in the chat box, or you can use the QR code on the screen by opening your phone's camera and holding it up, and it will a link will pop right open to that um, survey. You'll need to enter the four digit webinar code for today so that you know which one they know which one you're uh, surveying. And today's is 0423. And make sure that you hit submit at the end of the survey. I know if you don't fill it out now following the webinar, you will receive an email invitation to take it. And again, we use this tool to make ongoing improvements to our webinar series. But it's also provides feedback to our funders. So we, we would appreciate if you would take the time to complete that survey. If you missed one of our previous webinars, or especially if you want to share this session, the recordings can be found on our website, militarychild.org, under Programs, Trainings, and Initiatives. Click on For Parents in the middle of the screen, and you will see all the webinars that MSEC has to offer, and the link for that is in the chat box. We also want to invite you to take part on in many of our online professional development institute opportunities that can also be found on our militarychild.org website and the link is in the chat box. We also ask you to friend us on Facebook and follow us on Twitter. And if you haven't already done so, uh, we want you to check out School Quest. It is an online interactive tool specifically designed to support our highly mobile military families and students. Um, and I will say, even though it's been designed for the military families and students, anyone can use it. So feel free to share this link with others. It has so many resources and tips to help students achieve academic success from probably middle school up through college. Sign up for it today. Check it out. It is totally free. Uh, if you have any questions, concerns, or any education related questions for your military connected children, you can contact our military student consultants or MSCs. They are the premier source to help you with all of those questions. And to contact them, the phone number's on the screen and the link is in the chat box. If you're interested in getting a certificate of completion for today, please do complete that online survey. Uh, and if you would like a webinar or to receive one for a webinar in the past, a recorded one, you can contact uh, Kaylee Abernathy at military.child.org and that uh, her email is in the chat box. And we have some wonderful upcoming webinars. Next Tuesday, we have Homework Power Hour, Motivation Strategies for Military Families with Multiple Children. But that can be a challenge. And then Wednesday the 19th, Study Skills for High School Students. And remember that all of our webinars start at 12 o'clock uh, noon on Eastern time. And Catherine has put the links for those two webinars in the chat box should you wish to register. And then last but not least, we do want to give a special thanks to the Department of Air Force School Liaison Program, our funder, for making today's webinar possible. Thank all of you for your interest and your participation with today. We'll stay on for just a few more minutes. If you have any questions, feel free to use the chat box. Um, if not, we wish you a wonderful rest of your day.